excellent. Okay. Well, look, I'm really happy this afternoon to uh, uh, be chairing the session on, on a view from Persia. It's it's very exciting to hear the range of, of directions that we're going to be hearing about this afternoon. Christopher Tuplin on the Tea in Search of a Persian Dimension right here, uh, followed by John Highland, the command of Mardonius in its Achaemenid political context, and then Sean Manning, professionalism at the Tia. All very interesting and different uh, subjects regarding different uh, evidence, I think. Uh, I, 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 I hate to say uh, who did we did, Professor Christopher Tuplin of the University of Liverpool needs no introduction because we all know him well. I actually quickly did a check on my, my library uh, uh, search engine and I came up with 233 results of publications by no one other than Christopher Tuplin, which was most impressive. Now, he's published a number of important things, of course, a number of very important articles, uh, uh, more recently moving to Xenophon from his earlier focus on the earlier material. I have to say my favorite remains, his two articles, his pair of articles, All the King's Horse and All the King's Men. Uh, <laughs> were wonderfully yes. titled uh, and very, very valuable for me uh, in, in my, my own researches. But I don't want to delay any more and to welcome happily and enthusiastically Professor Christopher Tuplin with the Tia in Search of a Persian Dimension. Thank you very much, uh, Meg, and thank you to everyone who has made this event possible. So Persia in Search of a, the Tia in Search of a Persian Dimension. Well, so little time and so many Persian dimensions in terms of social or institutional behavior, sometimes banal, concubines and jewelry, sometimes less so and with echoes in unexpected places. Consider the horses with shaved mane on a funerary stele from Memphis that recall Herodotus' picture of the exequies for Mazistius. Of course, nothing is simple. Oscar Muscarella says that the stele is fake. <laughs> but what we really want is a Persian perspective, a Persia focalized dimension, if you will. Still not enough time for that, but here are four more or less whimsical shots at that target, a sort of potpourri of elusive observations, certainly not a beautifully through composed argument. My first shot, Greek versions of a Persian perspective. Aeschylus makes no attempt to imagine a Persian perspective, and Ctesias doesn't, so in, doesn't do so interestingly either, for switching the order of Salamis and Plataea and making Mardonius survive temporarily do not alter Xerxes' disastrous failure. Herodotus is different. Mardonius' decision to follow the Persian nomos of attack matches the opening of Book 7, where the expedition enacts existing nomos and there is a structural need for aggression, irrespective of success. This captures a Persian ideological truth, at least when targeting agents of the lie or other creators of disorder, while Book Nine's insistent focus on Mardonius' agency surely reflects a, state, a scapegoating strategy. Mm. Another approach is seen in Dio of Prusa. Xerxes claimed his expedition ended in triumph with the capture of Athens, a deliberate lie to keep subjects from getting restive. Marathon may be downsized to local resistance to a small detachment that arrived by accident, but Salamis and Plataea simply did not happen. Herodotus Artemisia hinted at a version of this strategy, and when Xerxes says Mardonius will pay for Leonidas' death, he concedes compensation for Spartan collateral damage in an enterprise whose only real target was Athens. Other positives were spinnable. The king's safe return, unprecedented engineering works at Hellespont or at Athos, the only place where the Persians left a permanent mark on Greece, the fact that Xerxes and the spear of the Persian man in the words of Darius tomb inscription had been further from Persepolis than ever before, and even the building of a new royal palace at Kalinae. But disinformation and silence had a big role to play. So shot two, documents we do not have and elusive grandees. What we really want is a word from the king. But Plataea was a defeat, so there was little apparent room for it in a royal utterance. The Xerxes royal inscriptions that do survive are building inscriptions, sometimes recording completion of Darius' work, the nomination as successor text, which affirms preservation, completion, and, and extension of Darius' work, the celebration of royal virtues, repurposing Darius' composition, and the diver inscription. This alone cuts loose from Darius. There is no reference to him save in the king's filiation, 
and there is some implicit distance. For though Darius too started his reign in a time of disorder, the terms in which Xerxes pictures his problems uh, are quite novel. But notoriously, we cannot objectively date this composition or say anything un uncontroversial about its relation to real events. From a Persian perspective, there was a disorder in Egypt and Greece at the time of Xerxes' accession and disorder in Babylon shortly afterwards. The Diva text devotes three distinct paragraphs to disorder that Xerxes has put right. A land that revolted, a land where Daiva were worshipped, and something other bad, some other bad occurrence. But to associate the two triads, the third and vaguest being an attempt to claim some sort of success in Greece, would doubtless be hermeneutical folly, though strangely tempting. So if not royal inscriptions, and in default of a Persian version of Isthmian 8, what about less elevated documents? The expedition generated an immense bureaucratic paper trail, but the results don't survive. In fact, almost nothing survives anywhere that belongs to 479 BC or the seventh year of Xerxes. The first of a series of green shirt vessels sent from Aracosia as a species of tax payment does date to 4798. The series ran on till 4365 and embraces 203 inscribed items, 82 of them dated. Those are high figures and it may not be wholly unreasonable to venture that 4798 was the year of inception, not just first preservation. But though it's nice to see the empire inventing new forms of taxation, it has no substantive connection with events 4,000 kilometers away. Another document from the Persepolis treasury from 479 PT 24 records payments for 28 workers making statues or images in March to May of that year. It was authorized with a fine seal stone in use at least since 4954 that bears the name of the King Darius and depicts the royal hero grasping two winged human headed bulls by their forelegs. This is entirely symbolic, of course, not a direct representation of the sort of human combat due to occur shortly on the Asopus, but it doubtfully expresses the mastery of disorder that Mardonius was supposed to achieve. The document is another reminder that when things went wrong in Greece, it was business as usual elsewhere. But there is extra piquancy. The business was creation of images, and these were surely part of the ideological resonant representation of royal power on the walls of Persepolis. That was a long lasting artistic labor unhampered by the inconvenience of military defeat in Boeotia or elsewhere. Its completion materialized silence as a strategy for defeat palliation and PT 24 can perhaps be called a documentary reflection of that strategy. Before the revolts of 4843, Babylonia was the place least unlikely to produce direct documentary reflection of the great expedition. But suppression of those revolts virtually wiped out the archives that might contain such documents, and I know of only five texts dating to the seventh year of Xerxes. Four are of no significance, but the fifth is nearly a bullseye, a document probably from 27th June 479 that mentions the major domo of one Mardonius. Unfortunately, this is, this is one of a small set of documents relating to the estate of Mardonius, two of which date from 478 to 7. So for this to be the Mardonius, either he survived the great expedition, for which Justin's assertion to that effect is not viable evidence, but merely a confusion with Artabadza's, or his estate survived his death for a year or more. Hence the suggestion that it needed to be formally reallocated, but that this did not happen immediately, perhaps because the king was in Anatolia until early 478, and then didn't get round to it. If one credits some version of the court upheavals in Herodotus 9 and an incipient rebellion in Bactria and the Saka lands, they might provide a fitting distraction on a geopolitical and family level. The idea that a mistake needed reallocation is not arbitrary. Just such a thing occurs in TADAEA 6.4, where the grant that Samshek's father had from Ashrama and the king is reallocated to Pasamshek. Now he has succeeded his dead, his dead father as Ashama's bailiff. Whether Mardonius, the king's cousin, and the humble Pasamshek are comparable is, of course, debatable. But might Xerxes have pondered for a while 
whether the eventual disservices of Mardonius meant that his son's entitlement to royal benefaction should merely be a done deal. To draw that interesting inference from a document about brick making might seem adventurous indeed to be making bricks without straw. Uh, the name Mardonius is alas not so rare that the possibility that the brick making dossier refers to someone other than Gobrias' son has to be rejected. As a dossier about Babylonian brick making, these texts are actually without parallel, a curious analogy to Ashama's own Babylonian documents that provide a unique insight into Babylonian sheep rearing. But it's not an analogy that demands that we classify Mardonius as someone of Ashama's grandee status. Still, whatever the case in Babylonia, uh, Mardonius is found at Persepolis, for he is the Mardonius whose wife and royal daughter receives rations between Susa and Persepolis in early 498. The wife's name may be Ratushtukta, uh, see the lower document on the screen, though if so, Her Herodotus claimed that he was, she was called Artazostri, Artazostri is wrong. But nothing in this earliest attestation of Mardonius adds anything significant to what we already knew about it. Less indeed, than comes from the earliest reference to Xerxes three months later that locates him rather unexpectedly in his late grandfather's Parthian satrapy. These few texts are not a representative sample of quasi platea relevant non-Greek items. They are all the quasi platea relevant non-Greek items. This is only not true if Mardonius' dissident opponent, Artabadza's son of Pharnakes, is also one or more of the following persons who appear in Persepolitan or Babylonian texts. An investigator of administrative irregularities in 51009, the satrap of Makash in 5054, and or son of A, the longtime overlord of the Persepolis economic system, and or B, Darius' uncle, and or C, an erstwhile associate of Mardonia's father in pre-Darian Babylonia, where people complained that their heavy corvée demands put a neck chains on the workers. But all of these enticing possibilities demand interpretative optimism, and one hesitates to affirm any of them. Shot three, the edges of empire. If Artabazus was ever satrap in Makash, he had been at one of the edges of the empire, and he ended up at another one as satrap of Dasculeum. Imperial borders and edges play a symbolic role in Xerxes' expedition, both in general, think of the Hellespont, but also of Xerxes' voyage of inspection from Thermae to Tempe, and specifically at Plataea, which was fought at the final frontier of the river Asopus, another stretch of water whose transgression has huge consequences. There is no time to go into details about these things, and I focus here on just one aspect of the thematic. The largest component of Mardonia's army consisted of Persians and Medes, Iranians from the imperial heartland. But everybody else comes from the imperial periphery. The Mysians, Phrygians, Egyptians, Ethiopians, Indians, Bactrians and Sakai, between them match the four corners of the empire as listed in Darius PH and Darius H that is Sparda, Kush, India, and the Saka beyond Sogdiana. And the Europeans, Thracians, Peonians, Greeks, correspond to the Skudra and the Takabara Ionians, people whose inclusion in imperial administrative ideological geography extended that four corners model. Mardonius army is thus, among other things, a symbolic one. The real reason, the real business was to be done by Persians and Medes, commanded by Mardonius and Artabazus. But the army represents the whole empire by embracing its outer edges. When Xerxes crossed the Hellespont, he displays his forces in all their ethnic diversity. At the final boundary of the Asopus, the same ideological gesture was, I think, being made. Shot four, picturing conflict at the ends of empire. I looked earlier at Greek literary constructions of a Persian perspective on Plataea. There are Greek visual constructions too, at least of Persian wars, in the form of Attic vase paintings. 
But although in earlier items anyway, these sometimes provide a modicum of dignity to the Persian figures, the bias is inescapably Hellenocentric. One might say that they construct a Persian foe who faces defeat with good grace, an exotic enemy who does his best in a hopeless situation, and so an analogue to Herodotus' famous assessment of the efforts of the Persians at Plataea. But whether any of the images we can now inspect are specifically resonant of that encounter remains moot. Proposed dates often seem to evade such an idea, with dates or date ranges highlighting 480, and few items have permitted a post-479 date close enough to 479 to make it likely that the image is not entirely generic. But then again, that may have been true from the outset. The danger is great that Attic artists were always really peddling variants of Marathon. But I shan't pursue that in turn instead to images on seal and gemstones that certainly encapsulate a Persian perspective by showing Persian victory over Greeks. There are no equestrian combat images to which anyone assigns a meaningful date range starting before 450. That's quite a long way from Plataea, and to save time, I leave them aside. But things are better with the earliest infantry items. 20 to 22, 28, 26, 31, and 35 in my catalogue of these types of objects. All of these have been assigned specific dates or date ranges that start before 479 and end by 450. Existing literature makes no unequivocal demand for any to predate the Persian attacks on mainland Greece, but Boardman thought item 35 related to the Ionian revolt and the restoration of order in Western Anatolia could in principle be an inspiration to devise Greek defeat images to match the Scythian ones already around in the 490s and earlier. But the making of Greek defeat images certainly survived Marathon and Plataea, and any that are post-Plataea exemplify palliation or simple denial of defeat. If Attic artists kept commemorating Marathon, Persian or Persophile ones kept commemorating Ephesus and Thermopylae. One distinction among the early images is between those that present a completely defeated Greek figure on the top row, and those that are more evenly matched on the bottom. It would, of course, be another hermeneutical absurdity to make the first type earlier, reflecting Ephesus or Thermopylae, the second later, half absorbing Greek success at Marathon and Plataea. In any case, Boardman's assignment of 35 to the Ionian Revolt would seemingly breach that model, and the fact that early Scythian images rarely show a thoroughly defeated enemy may suggest that the genre has no bias towards that model anyway. John Highland has discussed 20 to 22 used in Xerxes' reign, but no more precisely datable than that, in relation to Thermopylae, but I think one can legitimately discuss them and their variously dissimilar congeners in relation to Plataea too, and there is a special reason to do so because there is a genuinely new element to introduce into such a discussion. This concerns one of the congeners, uh, number 28. This banded agate scaraboid is now in the Getty Museum, but reportedly came from Apollonia Salbake, just south of the high road to Kalinae on the confines of Caria, Phrygia and Pisidia, and in an area that received Iranian settlement in Achaemenid times. The image is striking. The Greek is utterly flawed, his eyeless face staring at us, a trope expressive of loss of control, but also associated with monstrous or demonic figures. Nothing wholly like this happens on any other combat seals, and nothing even partially comparable occurs until much later. Meanwhile, the victorious king wears a version of the Persian robe that leaves much of his torso visible. That recalls the royal hero figure on monster combat scenes at Persepolis, but the exaggerated muscles give him an almost Heraclean aspect. And this is not a casual comparison. One view of type three uh, Darix and Sigloi is that it's, of, of, of the figure on Darix and Sigloi of type three, is that it's Knilauf royal figure echoes Heraclean iconography, while the Greek's frontal face and fallen posture on our gem have analogies in uh, representations of Heraclean combat with Cycnus. The Greeks' nudity and the Persians' clothing reflect iconographical stereotypes and might connote Persian heroism defeating Greek heroism, 
just as easily as Persian heroism defeating Greek weakness uh, and indeed depravity. We might even feel sympathetic or awestruck at the Greek's predicament rather than merely contemptuous. His mask-like facelessness in contrast with the strongly characterized king is perhaps alienating and disturbing rather than demeaning. On the other hand, his eyelessness could also evoke blindness to the Persian power that he has fruitlessly challenged and this alien enemy of a quasi heraclean king can very well be an evocation of the disruptive agents of the lie whom the Achaemenid king must suppress. But the really extraordinary thing about this gem is that it's not unique. For something almost exactly similar has recently come to light in a private collection. There are differences. The private gem is blue chalcedony. It's larger, the scaraboid shape is type A rather than B in Boardman's classification, and close comparison shows that the Getty artist produced the less stylish object that involves misunderstandings of what we see on the new gem. But there's no doubt the two artists were setting out to make exactly the same image. And this is remarkable. The survival of two gems with the same image is exceptionally rare and the survival of impressions from two near identical, but nonetheless distinct orig originals is not much more common. So we have here an extremely distinctive artistically Greek image of Greek Persian combat that we know was cut at least twice, the Getty one being copied either from the private gem or from some common source. It is moreover an odd coincidence at least that the same thing is true of the Perse per Persepolitan items to which our gems are the closest congeners, where we have two or three uh, distinct but virtually identical seal stones. How we pass this coincidence is a delicate question. Repeat cutting of images on gems and seals was doubtless more common than we know, and yet it increases the temptation to see the two gems as a Greek reaction to what was perhaps a much circulated Persian image of Greek defeat, a more extravagant stylistic and conceptual westernization, and the case of the perhaps western made adaptation of the same Persian image to an Egyptian setting that we find in catalogue number 18, an adaptation that could actually reflect Xerxes' suppression of Egyptian revolt in the 480s. In any event, the situation should make us pay a lot more attention to these Greek gems, and it gives the question of date a new urgency. John Boardman dated the Getty gem to the late 6th century in 1988 and to circa 450 in 2018. The second presumably supersedes the first, but the shift is disconcerting. So what about the new gem? Style, including comparisons with some notable gems in Boston, New York and St. Petersburg, and the presence of a hatched border around the image draw one to the late archaic era. Size, material, and perhaps shape would be more normal in the classical area defined by Boardman as starting in 480. Now, strong an ind indication they are that we should go for a date on the cusp of late archaic and classical, i.e. 490 to 70 rather than 500 to 480 is debatable. Size and material, at least, may primarily reflect the desire to produce an unusual and striking object to go with the unusual and striking image. The size and material of the Getty gem suit a late archaic date, and its shape, though proper to Greco-Persian subject matter, is not inconsistent with a late archaic date. If the Getty gem presupposes the private one itself, not just a common source, this works against a low date for the latter. In real terms, in fact, we are in the same uncomfortably fluid space between the 90s and the 70s that early Greek combat scenes inhabit in general. There is probably nothing to preclude the private gem being an immediate reaction to the Ionian revolt or to rule out its being an immediate reaction to Thermopylae. But it's worth insisting that it could be an affirmation of Persian superiority first devised when defeat had already happened. The early 480s would have been an excellent time for such a gambit, a gambit for which the Persepolitan image would provide a parallel and even a stimulus, just as it could have stimulated an Egyptian biform in precisely the same date horizon. What happened at Marathon was not the end of the matter, and reaffirmation of the restoration of order in Anatolia would have been perfectly, permitting, perfectly fitting. 
And even when worse happened at Salamis and Plataea, glyptic celebration of Persian defeat of disorder on the empire's Greek edge continued in the same spirit in seal images that were less artistically distinguished than that on the new gem or even the Getty copy, but did sometimes faintly echo its representation of a Greek soldier collapsing in face of Persian might. In the end, it seems fair to me to regard all of these early gems and seal stones as giving us some sort of access to one Persian perspective on Plataea. Thank you. Sorry, I'm enthusiastically thanking you while I'm muted. Thank you so much, <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, uh, and raising very interesting questions, typically uh, carefully examining different sorts of data, not easily accessible to less thorough researchers and, and coming up with interesting results. Absolutely, absolutely terrific. I, I find that the, um, the whole question of who made the gems very interesting. I'm scratching mm. my brain to try to remember whether or it, uh, when or whether we actually get profile eyes in, in this sort of, of seal stone. Uh, these are very strong uh, frontal yep. eyes and, and that should be a dating factor, but maybe it isn't. And maybe that's why Boardman changed his it, mind. I, I think it's extremely unusual in seal stones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so that doesn't help us uh, date them at all. Yeah, no, fascinating, I'm I mean, sorry. I, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, please carry on. No, I mean, I, I, I should stress that, um, uh, A, I am absolutely no expert in, in any form of Greek art, and B, my, my engagement with, with this particular seal stone because of becoming aware of, of, of the new version of it is still in very early days. So um, I, I am looking for anyone who can tell me <laughs> anything useful about them. Look, it's... it's a fascinating question. I, I won't respond because I should open the floor to people who want to ask questions rather than dominate the chat with Christopher. Yep. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Um, yeah, any responses or, or thoughts or contributions? Yes. John has, John has got his hand up. Yes, John, yes. Chris, uh, Christopher, thank you for that uh, wonderful paper. And, and uh, again, we've learned a lot from it and um, from your uh, amazing catalog of the, the human combat scenes uh, and seals. Uh, which has, has really opened up new perspectives uh, on Persian-Greek relations from a Persian point of view. Um, I think what I, what I take most from this is the idea that we can't be uh, restricted to, to looking for a lost narrative version, uh, for, for lamenting the lack of a Bissetun inscription to describe what happens in, in Greece. Um, I think here we have a, a, a use of visual language uh, to, to convey the, the messages that the Persian king wants to, or, or elites in the Persian empire want to convey about uh, that Persian Greek contact. Um, I would thank you also on, on the comments on the, uh, this exciting new seal. Uh, and you've given me a lot to, to think about. Uh, I'm giving a paper next month at a conference at the Pur Davud Center in, uh, and the Gadi in UCLA. Um, in which I'm trying to write up a, a discussion comparing the PTS 28 scene, mm -hmm. uh, so the, the king stabbing the kneeling hoplite, uh, with those Egyptian uh, Persian triumph over Egyptian scenes. Um, so I'll, I'll look forward to probably talking more with you as, as I'm trying yeah. to find something extra to say. The one other that I, I wondered if you had additional thoughts on um, was the number 35 in your catalog, uh, which mm -hmm. is this the strange seal that Boardman commented on uh, that has a woman uh, mm -hmm. in the center and then a, a Persian figure on the right and a nude Greek uh, Kouros uh, on the left um, re resisting him. I, I, I don't actually have any, any, any really any further thoughts on that. I think in, in the catalog, I, I, I described Boardman's interpretation as, as slightly fanciful, but it is an odd image, and I am I'm painfully conscious that having that that I paid almost no attention to the item that I have now just discussed at some length in that catalogue. I, I I just went straight past it and didn't even in its Getty form. It is actually quite extraordinary, and I didn't notice that. Um, so I'm I'm very conscious that something like number thirty five uh, is is something I should probably think a great deal more about because it's in its own way as weirdly unusual. 
Um, I mean, there are later combat scenes where the, 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 this kind of format where you have two standing figures on either side and a figure in between um, comes in, in a variety of slightly different forms. But And sometimes there are issues about who is defending whom. Um, that is, I think, reasonably clear on, on number 35, but uh, but the particular version of it is is very strange. Um, and uh, I guess in effect, Boardman interpreted the woman as a as as as, a, as an image of of Lydia. I mean, um, maybe it could be an image of all sorts of other things, <laughs> I suppose. But I don't know. Do you I, have I, any I, any, I, I any do new have idea? A thought on that, and it's it's a little adventurous still. That I'm, I've been after reading your catalog, I've been trying to track down more information and see if there's much more written on that seal. Um, the, what I've really been looking at is the standing, the nude male Greek on the left who's, who's reaching over the woman and, and who's opposed to the, the Persian hero figure. Um, the, he exhibits some musculature. And, and again, I'm, I'm not an art historian um, by training, but he, the pose uh, looks you know, a typical of a, an archaic kuros, um, mm. except for he, he's raising a hand over the head uh, mm. and he's wielding what, what Boardman described as a club, uh, but it looks to me like it could be a copus. Um, and I, I thought immediately of the uh, tyrannicide statue group. Uh, yes. And the idea of Xerxes yes. and, you know, whether or not he took the tyrannicide group from, mm. from Athens, which has been debated in some recent literature. Uh, so I, I, I would love to see you know some visual yeah. allusion to plunder in Athens there, but I, I may be stretching yeah. that too far. I mean, how one how one would parse that? I I don't know. <laughs> yes, uh, but I I am very conscious. I actually ought to pay some more attention to that that one because it is like the Getty seal and the new one. It is very unusual. Um, strange image. Yeah. Um, two comments. I was just going to say that, I mean, this is wonderful, uh, that I was going to have to introduce John Howland so that John Howland can speak. Uh, but that's why <laughs> yeah. I interrupt, I should say. But, but um, I, I hate to, to cramp a conversation that's so interesting when we have two more questions to raise. And also, um, I wanted to ask you, Christopher, I don't know this article. I'm really ashamed uh, that I don't know your catalog. Can you type oh. it into to the, to the oh. comments um, in the yeah. chat? Uh, uh, I can try to do that. It's um I it's now available on my academia site. Um, I decided okay. earlier today that two years had passed and that, that that I could put it out in public. So it is you'll find it if you go to my academia site you can find it there. Um, but I can I can type the reference uh, in into the chat um, probably. I mean oh, you know I'm lim limits of my technological capacity here, but I can okay. probably. But, but meanwhile, I, I should invite uh, Sean Manning to, to ask his question, if you can type and, and hear a question at the same time. Uh, probably not, so I'll do the typing later. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, Sean is... Uh, just, just, yeah. just to two big associations, the, the, the seal with the woman in the middle is, is interesting because, of course, there's that famous observation by Margaret Poole Root that the only uh, female at Persepolis is one of the lions being presented as, as tribute. Mm -hmm. And we, so we certainly don't often see a uh, woman in any kind of came in official iconography, sometimes in Dark from the Aegean or uh, there's, there may be, there's one seal still, I think, some, some, somewhere, but yeah, that is that is striking. The, the, there are occasional sealstone images of enthroned women. Yeah, um, which, which kind of use the format of the enthroned king from Persepolis and yeah. also from sealstones, um, uh, and and people debate a little bit about what sort of status those women have. But they are, I mean, they they're represented as power figures anyway. Yeah, yeah, not unlike, unlike this one. Being fought yeah. over. Hmm. And yeah, the other thing different. is the. The, the musculature on the uh, Getty seal and the yeah. one in the private collection. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the parallel with Her Hercules. It also reminded me of Neo-Assyrian art, which was, likes to emphasize the wiry muscles on the Assyrians. And we mm -hmm. don't see that so much in the Canaan art. Oh, no, exactly. Bodies but that's, usually, bodies that's... usually all nicely covered up with long tunics or the, yeah. or the flowing robes. But yeah. so whether that's whether that's whether that's uh, Greek influence and I, Greek I, assume that's an interesting point. Um, I'm 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 very tempted by the Hercules thing. It, 
And of course, type three Darix and Sigloy probably came into use precisely in this same era, 490 through 480. Um, I mean, I like to tell myself a story that, 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 that someone in Anatolia has got hold of this idea of, 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 of equating the king with Heracles, and it comes out in yeah. these two different forms um, in, 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 um, in coins on the one hand and on this seal in the other. But I mean, I, you know, I, I talk about Boardman being fanciful. I have to say, I suppose that's fanciful too. <laughs> And, and then a hundred years later, there's also the, the anecdote about the Gisileus displaying the bodies of his Persian cap, captives for the Greeks to show that they aren't, they aren't much just mad, they're just a bunch yeah. of flabby. You know, for a Greek artist to make the Persian king so, so muscly, is, um, is, is, it's, it's very deliberate. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, I, I, I hate to say we're, we're already running into our group conversation time, but Han has had a hand up. Hans has had his hand up. You put it down. Do you, you want to give us a quick question or, or um, save it for later? I can't. I'm worried that this comes across like not in the right way, but um, and this was fantastic material. And I'm and I'm I'm learning a lot about these things. I know nothing. So so thank you, Christopher, uh, for this. But is there a possibility? This is a very open question. Is there a possibility that we are reading things into this symbolic and visual language as we approach this with our Hellenic eyes and skills and cultural norms um, that not only are really not relevant to where they are communicated in Central Asia, um, but where they are really where they would be decontextualized in a way that they wouldn't make any sense that we are looking at. I mean, the whole audience interaction and the whole circulation of these images is culturally encoded in a way that is totally different from what we are used to seeing our evidence. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just asking, I'm not critiquing, I'm, I'm really asking because I don't know. Well, but I'm audience, that we use yeah. our paradigms here. That um... I mean, uh, audience is, of course, I mean a vital issue. And uh, the thing about, I mean, the the Getty seal, I mean, all the the the, the kind of Hellenizing versions of this sort of imagery. Um, I mean, I think precisely because they they um, they they come from a Hellenic artistic point of view, among other things, where I think we have to be entitled. As entitled to read them as we are other Greek um, visual products, um, in the way which <laughs> the sort of way we traditionally do. I mean, uh, embodying a whole bunch of prejudices and, and so forth. I mean, you're, you're quite right. Um, when a thing is produced at the heart of the empire um, in um, you know, a style appropriate to seal making in Persepolis, which has a um, a Persian king hero killing a Greek. Um, I mean, this, if seals speak to anybody, if seal images are meant to speak to anybody, um, and the sheer proliferation and variety of them in Persepolis, on the one hand, may suggest that there are so many no one can take them in and, and they all become a blur, but on the other hand, suggests an endless inventiveness on the part of artists um, to try and make some sort of visual point. I mean, if, if one can, you know, marry those two in any sort of reasonable way, it seems to me somebody was making an image and, and actually more than one, I think, um, which has to be read as Persians defeating Greeks. Um, and they were doing that in the middle of the em empire and at least some of the people who saw the impressions it made and the people who owned the seals that made them um, were being given a message of some sort. Um, Christopher, the how one... complicated we make the message, you know, could be an issue, but yeah, sorry, Meg, yeah. No, as I say, um, I, the one that had a sort of provenance was from the Western Empire. Um, and if we, we don't have a provenance for both of these ones, the style, the yes, looks pretty Hellenizing or Hellen, Hellenic, I should say. Mm -hmm. And the, to respond to the question of, of audience, if they were both from the Western Empire, i.e. Ana Western Anatolia, the people there would be perfectly capable of reading um, the imagery as we would through Greek eyes. Yeah, they would yeah. make 
they make no sense for the East. I, I agree with that at this point. Uh, but if they if they really are to be read as Western Anatolian in the Dasculeon area or wherever, um, it's not such a, a, a tension of, of uh, style and comprehension as it would be further east. Because you're not oh, saying those yeah, two are indeed, it, it, indeed, the point is to create images that do speak to a Western Anatolian or Greek audience um, uh, alongside or, you know, versions of things, that, images that appear in the center of empire, um, given a westernized force. Um, I mean, I, I, I think, I think that seems reasonable. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, it is really easy to over reify this, of course. And the longer you look at, at an image and the longer you look at it blown up on the screen, not actually at the size of the gemstone or an impression, the, the, the easier it is to, to get you know, overblown ideas, I guess. That's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, John, do you mind if we uh, take uh, Yanis's question? Well, sure, go ahead. <laughs> Yanis, please. <laughs> sure, thank you. Uh, well, Mr. Tuplin, um, touched to beat my question uh, in his previous comment, but um, a seal stone is not a monument. It's oh. something that someone wears. And my question, I guess, is who was supposed to wear these rings and who was supposed to see those rings? And whether it's more a personal statement for the man wearing it, like saying, I have been to this war, I have killed Greeks, I'm here back alive, whatever the outcome of the expedition was, uh, or I have been given this ring from the king, from the palace, because I, I was there in the campaign and I, I contributed. And so we, who was supposed to see, how were they, they supposed to be used, these seals? Well, I mean, the seal stones are used as the name suggests to seal with. Um, and they are, you're right, uh, they are not monuments, they are very personal objects. And, I, and, and, and indeed, it's, in, it's important to stress that. Um, and, and again, it's one of the dangers of what I was talking about earlier, that we, we, we get overexcited about the degree of, of personal investment in the particular images that particular individuals have. Um, I mean, we, we can never really know what the process is that results in a particular individual having as the seal he, he uses a particular image. And, and we can get overexcited about people commissioning things in particular ways and so on. Um, but a seal is, is a very personal object. Um, it is unlikely that a man would use, or a woman would use a seal with an image on it that they found completely unacceptable to their sort of ideological mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and it may sometimes be the case that they do go out of the way to get one that is positively um, expressive of it. And many cases may be somewhere in between. Your idea that a man might seek to have such a seal, as it were, for the personal reason that he has been involved in a public event, a war, and has survived it, rather than for, as it were, the public reason that that war is being constructed as having had a certain character is a that's a really good point to think about actually um i, I think that's um that is a very important point um the odd thing though is that that across the whole of this repertoire of images of this sort um they are virtually all either greek or scythian or occasionally Egyptian, and almost never anything else. So you kind of wonder whether, I mean, if you privilege the sort of personal experience model, on the face of it, there ought to be a greater range of images, uh, species of adversary. Um, my kind of feeling is the genre as a whole bespeaks, not exactly an officially imposed anything, but somehow a the emergence of the idea that you you make images of victorious control that relate to the peripheries of the empire. And this trickles down um, in, with the result that 
that the people who make such images at the peripheries of empire, so in styles that are wholly on Persian, um, kind of fall in line with that. But I, I, I acknowledge that's also a slightly fantastical discourse. 